Our next speaker is an artist who really will make you rethink what you see. Please welcome Alexa Mead. Hi, my name is Alexa Mead. And I'm interested in not only coloring outside of the lines, but also coloring off the edge of the page. And how can we identify what these lines are that shape our perceptions and help us make sense of the world and to show that they aren't fixed and static, but constantly in flux? What I'm doing with my art is skipping the canvas altogether and painting directly on top of whatever it is I want to paint a picture of. And I've invented this technique for painting in three-dimensional space that collapses it and makes it look like a two-dimensional painting. And this is all without Photoshop or post-processing. It's all just in the way that I paint in space. And you might be asking me, where did I learn to paint like this? Where did I go to art school? But actually, I'm a self-taught painter. Last time I painted was when I was in summer camp, and I'd studied politics. And you might also be wondering what the original inspiration for this project was. I didn't set out to turn people into paintings. And actually, the seed of the idea was something very different. I was interested in shadows and how do I capture them and bring materiality to the absence of light. So I started painting the grass where the shadows were and I thought there was something interesting here. And what if in, what if in addition to painting shadows, I also painted light? So I painted my friend Bernie in grayscale and all of, a something, all of a sudden something happened and I didn't quite understand what it was, but I decided that this was something worth exploring. And I was a little bummed that I hadn't studied painting. I was a little bit insecure about my artistic abilities. And so I decided I needed to practice and hone my craft. But I didn't want to paint on canvas. That's not what this project was originally about, and that's not where I wanted to take it. I wanted to teach myself how to paint through a different means. And so I found other subjects, like fried food. And I was interested in how can I turn this egg into a painting when Specifically, paint will not stick to cooking grease. And I tried this project several times, but I kept on poking through the egg yolk, and the yolk would just run into the acrylic, and it was an absolutely disgusting mess. But that mess was kind of what drew me to it and made me want to continue pushing it. So in addition to painting on food, I started painting on other non-traditional surfaces, like old men and old men on the tube. And so now it wasn't just art on the page, but art in real life and on the streets and in your face. It was this living, breathing thing that wasn't fixed into any place. And part of what makes this illusion so effective is that there's the lines that exist in real life. There's this line of the person, but then there's also the lines that I draw that redefine the shape. The outline on the edge of the man's arm continues into an outline that's a couple meters back on the wall. And by collapsing these outlines, I'm able to give the illusion that it's only one line and not multiple. But then when you see a reveal shot, you recognize that this does exist in three-dimensional space and your perception is better able to make sense of what you're seeing. But I was also really interested in how do I make this space more continuous? This line on the man also exists several meters back and what if I brought it closer together? So I came together with a collaborator, performance artist Sheila Vand, and we wanted to find a way to merge these two objects into one continuous three-dimensional painting. And so we decided to do this. We needed a different background plane, something that was more fluid. And the fluid that we ultimately ended up choosing was milk. We got a warehouse. We filled it with a pool, filled it with milk, filled it with Sheila. And I began my paintings from there. And so now the background was immediately connected to the body and that there wasn't one firm outline. It was constantly in flux, it was changing. And then when I would draw my lines physically on Sheila, something interesting would happen. It was no longer a line that was separating her from the background, but a line that would merge her into it. The paint on her body would bleed into the milk in a way that would define the space, but then the milk would also bleed onto her body in unpredictable ways and drip into it. And so not only was the subject something that was created to stand out from the background. The background was something that was created to bleed into the subject as well. And so the unpredictable nature of the milk not only informed the outlines, but it also informed the contours of her body. I'd originally painted arms on Sheila, but once they got wet with the milk, the paint would no longer stick to it. It was too slippery. And so we had to adapt and choose a different shape. And so in the later images, we'd have to have her sit with her arms behind her back to hide them. 
And um, in this piece, we were really interested in how do we make a fixed form with a living background and have that constantly be in flux. And so to achieve this, we had the milk level somewhat low so it wouldn't spill onto her body. And we did all the painting on her back. I'd have her lift up and I'd put blue paint on the back of her hair, her shoulders, and have her lay down. And every time that she came down, it would send a little shock wave of ripples through the milk. I'd have her sit back up, put yellow paint on, and we'd repeat. And so there was this time-based painting that was happening on her back, and yet it becomes in the forefront of the work. And so there's this concentric tree ring pattern that shows the history that happened in this process. And also, while you see on the surface the nature of time with the work, we would reuse the same pool of milk several times. And the moment that you just kind of stir it up a little bit, all the paint would fall down to the bottom. So within one canvas, there's multiple paintings built into this same piece. And when we first started this out, we didn't know what we were doing, so we started with playtime. We blew bubbles in milk, we threw glitter in it. We wanted to figure out how to make polka dots, so we would fill up a vial with Kool-Aid and drop it in and let it kind of fizzle and do what it does. We'd mix in instant pudding to create different textures. And all of this was a lot of fun, but something we recognized was that this was really scary, because playtime could also be a waste of time and a waste of milk. And what if this didn't lead anywhere? And we had all these little points and dots, and it was up to us to make sense of them. And it was scary trying to make these connections, because we didn't know if they would connect to anything bigger, if they would lead anywhere. Because if you're creating a new path through the woods, and there aren't already benchmarks there to establish progress, how do you know that you're actually moving in the right direction? So it was up to us to create these lines between them. And we recognized that these lines between the points weren't linear, and they weren't necessarily fixed. And it wasn't here to here, but maybe there to there, and scattered all over the place. And in playtime, we actually tried to make physically straight lines, and we recognized that it was nearly impossible to make them stick. We tried squirting paint in a line, and if you've ever made chocolate milk, you know that you squirt it, and then it instantly sinks down to the bottom, and you don't see any of that history there. Well, you see it stirred up, but you don't see it in a straight line on the surface. So our solution for that was to take a piece of rope, cover it in paint, and like rest it on the surface for a few moments. The paint would bleed out, but then it would form a thick bar. And so in order to make a thin line, we would then push the rope quickly down into the milk, and it would um, tighten it up. But after just a few moments, it would start to wobble away, and then it would dance away and form something like that red swirl that in no way resembles a straight line. And just as we had to draw lines between these different points, we also had to disconnect the dots and be willing to throw things out. When we first started this project, we were not quite sure where we were going with it, and then we came across something beautiful, and then we realized all of a sudden we kind of need to clean up this mess we made. And this was the biggest mess I've ever made in my entire life. It was absolutely disgusting. In case you're wondering, I'm standing ankle deep in rotten milk, and I have a dustpan that I'm using to scoop it and to kind of throw it down the street in an alleyway in downtown LA. Um, and this thing, that had once been so beautiful, this piece of artwork, was now the bane of my existence. It was absolutely disgusting, and it proved to be a big mess. And that, while the painting had a lifespan of its own, so did the milk. And all of these <coughs> objects involved were constantly in flux, in flux and not fixed. And so, looking at the final artwork, it's so different than this disgusting alleyway in downtown LA and that everything is constantly changing and has its own life cycle. And even though you can look at this and see that moment to moment, how rapidly it changes, these two photos were taken within a split second of each other, and already the milk has uh, bled into Sheila in one. And you can look at these images and know consciously what it is that you're seeing. That's a woman covered in paint, laying in a pool of milk, and yet you would think otherwise, that it looks like a painting. And maybe it's because our perceptions of the world are aligned in a certain way that we would think that it's something that it is not. And even though we know these lines that we draw to color our perceptions can be faulty and imaginary, we still hold them close to us and we make them real because we want them to be real. It's easier to follow a rope through the woods to guide the way than to snip it and find another circuit through on your own. And so sometimes I have to remind myself too that the lines define, that define me are also an illusion that I have these perceptions about myself which maybe 
I need to have being open to change. I'd studied politics, and I had this idea that this was what I wanted to do with my life. I had all my points lined up so I could see straight down into my future. I knew where I wanted it to take me, and I was on that progression path. And then one day, I stumbled upon another dot, and I painted it black on one blade of grass. And then it just kind of evolved organically into something completely different. And I kept on trying to fight that urge to go off into a different direction, because I'd already had this nice path ahead of me. And I couldn't imagine myself at that time doing anything else. But just because I couldn't imagine that I would be doing this didn't mean that that reality didn't exist. It's just that I hadn't figured out a way to connect the dots to access that other reality. And now today, I can't imagine doing anything else. I mean, I love it. Even the part of being submerged in rotten milk, it's still part of the process and it's beautiful. But I have to remind myself that just because this is where I see myself right now doesn't mean that in the future more dots won't align to create something different. And I have to be open to my shape constantly changing. And we have to be open to our perceptions changing and these contours that inform the way that we view the world. And so I would challenge you to figure out what are these lines that you use to define yourself and to color the world around you? How can you break outside of them and color off the page? Thank you.